garlic, the base of so many of the dishes we know and love, especially if you're Italian like I am. Sauces, stews, even homeopathic remedies all begin with garlic as a base ingredient. If you've never grown garlic before, you know it as the crusty, moldy bulbs that you get at the grocery store. But I have recently learned that the grocery store garlic does not scratch the surface of the potential of the flavor and variety of garlic that we can have access to as gardeners. But you got to grow it. There are so many varieties of garlic that you just can't find at the grocery store, but you can order them online and grow them in your garden. Garlic is also a natural pest repellent for gardeners and takes up little space in our gardens and gives us two yields, the bulbs and, for some varieties, the scapes. There's a world of garlic you never knew about to be opened up to you with this episode, my sweet plant friend. Get comfortable and get ready. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Hello, my sweet plant friends. I hope you're doing well. I hope you've had a wonderfully planty week. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Maria, your host. It's my life's duty to help you cultivate plants and grow joy by doing so. And as we cultivate plants, if we're gardeners, friendly reminder, plant friends, wear your sun protection in the shade. If you've been following me on social media, you know that I have recently gone through a melanoma diagnosis because of skin damage. I've been getting multiple surgeries in order to remove it, and I've gotten very into skin care and sun protection. So if you're interested in my exploration of sun protection for gardeners, different hats, different sunscreens, you can go follow me on socials at Growing Joy with Maria, where I'm kind of profiling my day-to-day sun protection exploration. And to be clear, we found the melanoma early. I'm going to be totally healthy after this whole process of removing it is done. Oh, this episode is so good. It is with our special guest, Jill Winger, a homesteader, author, blogger, and the host of her own podcast, Old Fashioned On Purpose. Jill is all about slow living. I love that we've actually had multiple homesteaders on the show lately to discuss kind of the next steps of once we're in the garden, once we're nailing growing our own food, What are the next steps to kind of take that step towards a more cyclical, holistic approach to our gardens that are just beyond the flowers and the food that we grow? And today's episode is specifically celebrating the mighty garlic bulb, not just a deeper understanding of garlic and how it grows and the varieties, but actually how to grow it and use it for months and months and months after you harvest it. Jill is amazing. I consider her a new plant friend. I'm so excited to introduce her to you. But before that, speaking of plant friends, I want to shout out and say a quick thank you and welcome to Dina A., Michelle T., and Meredith D., our newest Garden Society members. If you don't know, I have my own social media platform. It is a algorithm and troll-free platform that you can access via your computer or iOS or Android. It's the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. It's a private platform I created for our listeners to get together and make new plant friends, propagate your knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. I love it. They're the nicest people on that app. And also, it's a wonderful way of supporting the podcast because your monthly subscription also goes towards supporting all of the amazing contractors who help me support the show, especially while I am currently out on medical leave as I'm dealing with this melanoma diagnosis. I have incredible contractors. Shout out Bailey, Morgan, Rain, Jazz, this team of people that I have that are keeping the ship afloat as I am home resting with Mama Faella taking care of me. If you want to join us, go to jointhegardensociety.com and all of the instructions to sign up will be there. All right, Jill, garlic. I'm so excited. The Italian in me was so excited about this episode. And another thing about garlic is I feel like the more gardeners I talk to, like, and you ask what are their favorite plants to grow, I'm always shocked at how much people love to grow garlic. Like real gardeners grow garlic, I feel like. Melody, my garden friend who I I gardened with a couple of years ago, she grew so much garlic and we had so much fun. So anyway, the real gardeners are growing garlic, guys. So get ready because we're about to teach you how to do it. So without further ado, here's Jill. Jill, welcome. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today. I cannot wait for this conversation. I've been looking forward to it. 
we are so overdue for an episode just on garlic because I feel like garlic is like the unsung hero of the garden. Real gardeners always talk about garlic as being one of their favorite, you know, things to grow. But before we dive into that, I need to know you are my future goals of living the most epic homestead life. Can you just take a couple minutes to fill the audience in on how you became this homesteading goddess that you are? Oh my goodness, you're so funny. Yes, I would love to share my journey because it was very much accidental. I didn't intend to be doing what I am today. I love it. Can't imagine anything else. But yeah, so I started off, I was raised really conventionally. I wasn't raised in agriculture or on a farm or ranch, but I've always had this desire in me, this little tug that I wanted to be more connected to a rural way of life. And so when I turned 18, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I decided I've always loved horses. And so I moved to Wyoming to pursue a horse career. Long story short, met my husband. We needed to buy our first home and we needed a horse property. And so we came across this tumble down old property that had a really horrible little house, but it was within our budget and it had land for the horses. And so we bought it. And then this thing happened where we signed on the dotted line and all of a sudden, I don't know where it came from, which is kind of hit with this inspiration that I needed to make the land be productive. And I'd never thought about that before. I never really considered that. I was, again, very conventional, didn't really care about food or what I was eating. Really, I thought organic was just ridiculous. So I was like very much the opposite end of the spectrum. But I was like, man, how can I make this land productive? And so I started to explore those ideas. I didn't know what homesteading was. Homesteading wasn't a thing. YouTube wasn't a thing. So I got a whole bunch of old books from the library. We put in a compost pile and then the garden came, then the chickens, then the dairy goats and the cattle. And lo and behold, I found myself living what we now call a homestead life. And so as that has progressed, I've fallen even more deeply in love with it. And now I get to share it with the world online. And so it's been a really fun journey that I never saw coming. I love it. And what's the name of your blog and the name of your podcast, just so people know? Yeah, so the blog, the original blog, I started it back in 2010. It's The Prairie Homestead. And then my podcast is Old Fashioned On Purpose. I love that, Old Fashioned On Purpose. And I feel like there's such a movement right now. I mean, you obviously were so ahead of the trend, but there's such a movement to slower living and, you know, that old fashioned idea. I mean, my sister jokes with me that the longer I live in the country, I turn into like a colonial woman because my hobbies have turned into sewing. And, you know, I literally made butter the other day and gardening. And, you know, she still lives a very fast paced lifestyle. And it's so funny because it feels so natural to me. But I know from the outside looking in, it's also so shocking and weird, especially because that's not who I used to be. So how much land are you on? We have 67 acres, which... For a lot of places in the country, that's a lot. Where we live in Wyoming, that's like a big backyard because we ha- we're surrounded by okay. r- ranchers with thousands of acres. So yeah, it works well. Gardening is tricky here. It's much easier to grow animal animal product than it is vegetables. So that has been a huge learning curve for me. I've killed a lot of plants basically, but I'm still growing stuff. So here we are. Yeah. Hey, who hasn't? Yeah. So what's your zone? Because you must have a tiny growing window. Yes. So I think we're 5B. And I can plant my sensitive stuff on Memorial Day. And depends on the year. Sometimes I can grow into late September. But like two years ago, I had a snow, like a legit snow on September 8th. So. Oh, my goodness. Not a lot of time. Yeah. (laughs) Very short. Okay. So that's a very limited time to get. And you're growing. And then are you processing and saving most of the food in your garden to eat throughout the year? Yes. We do a lot of preservation canning, freezing, dehydrating. So yeah, that's a big part. And like at the beginning, I would grow a ton of different things. And now I'm like really honed in on, you know, a lot of the things that we're just really eating, a lot of potatoes, a lot of onions, a lot of tomatoes for sauce. So I've kind of like figured out what we really like over the years and weeded out the extra. Yeah. I mean, I've got 20 grow bags. I mean, my garden looks very different than yours, but it's funny. Us too, we were just like, let's just grow tomatoes lettuce and herbs this year, because that's really what we're using on a daily bait. I'm like, let's just grow our salads this year and then we'll freeze our tomatoes. We're growing way too many tomatoes for two people. So what does your garden look like? So it's really morphed over the years. We started off with a a really traditional in-ground garden. And then I actually accidentally poisoned it with herbicide. I didn't realize I was bringing herbicide in that was in my manure that I was using for compost. And so, yeah, it was tragic. It was like, it was tragic. So it was a number of years ago, I think seven years ago, I realized that I had basically contaminated all my soil. And so 
we were like, do we scrape all the soil out or do we build something else on top? And so we decided to build raised beds, which has been really good. I don't know if I would build them exactly the same way if I were to start over, but they've been great for us. And they were kind of been iconic of our homestead. A lot of people know my raised beds by just their appearance online. So we have a pretty big raised bed garden. I have 20 beds that are four by eight. And then we have a greenhouse that we built three or four years ago that just gives me a little more time on the beginning and the end of my growing season. So it's not heated, but it just, man, it feels so good. Our winters are so long and I can just get out there in the sun, you know, and wear like a light jacket in February versus like a parka and be in the soil. And then we recently put in two really long strips of potatoes and onions because we're growing so much of that. So I have kind of three growing spaces that I've, you know, and I definitely couldn't have done that when I first started all at once, but we've just stacked on top of each other over the years. So it feels mostly doable. There's sometimes I still feel like completely overwhelmed by it, but most of the time it feels pretty good. Well, overwhelm. So let's address that for a minute because I want to get into garlic, but I think for those listening who just heard about your 60 acres and your greenhouse and like checked out being like, I can't relate to this girl you know, that is so far from where I am. Because even me on five acres with my grow bag garden, setting you as my goal, like my vision board still feels a little intimidated by that. Like, what would you say to people? Can you speak a little bit to those first couple of years of your homesteading journey? Because obviously, this has been a long term process that you've built on. Oh, absolutely. It's And that's the key is building on it's the layers. And so I think that's one of the beauties and also one of the dangers of social media is we often see people like me who are kind of towards the middle. They're in the middle end of our journey, not end of our journey. That sounds weird. I hope it's not the end of my journey, but like the middle of our journey, right? You're advanced. Yeah, you're 2.0. Yeah, I've been doing this since 2000. We bought a property in 2008. Like that's a long time to be doing this. And so I've gone through all those iterations, but the people who just started following me last year don't didn't get to see that. And so I started off so humbly, so small. Where I remember those first few years that a small in-ground garden was all I could handle, like physically, mentally, that was it. And that was okay. We still grew a lot of food and it was still what you could definitely deem successful. I think this works with any skill that we're learning. As I started to get comfortable with that, I got into my routines. I started to figure out what worked and what didn't. I got through that kind of decision fatigue phase where we're trying to figure out all the things. Then I'm like, oh, well, this feels kind of easy now. Then that's when we started to expand. And we're just like one step up each year or maybe every other year, not even every year, right? So just one step up, one step up. And that's where we added on. And so I never had started all these things at once, right? There was a season of learning how to milk the cow. There was a season where I was really focused on canning. There has been a season where I was really focused on certain aspects of my business. And what people don't see is when I was like really focused on, let's say, building my online platforms, some of my homesteading stuff got put on the back burner or just was non-existent. Like right now, I don't have a sourdough starter going. I was going to make cheese this summer and my life kind of blew up with one of our businesses. So I have no cheese. I've been using store-bought milk, even though we're milking the cow for some bottle calves we have. So people have to understand, like, I think they assume it's all happening simultaneously, but at least for me, it hardly ever is. And it sounds like it's non-linear as well. You know, you take two steps forward and then the cow gets... The interesting thing too is I feel like what you just said, even just with gardening, you could spend 40 years of a Four Seasons trial and error, right? Like there's never someone who has the same exact garden every single year. There's always going to be something you're going to try. There's always going to be something new in your garden that you're growing. That's why we do this, right? The fact that you're doing that with the garden and milk cows and cattle and chickens, like that's a lot to juggle. And you're also doing it full time, which is also super helpful. So how long have you been growing garlic for? Oh, I think probably at least probably around a decade. And I would start it off with just a few little pieces at first. And then I realized how much I loved it and how easy it was because it's just ridiculously easy. I think more people don't do it just because the timing is off of our, what we really consider normal growing yeah. seasons. And so we, I used to forget. I'm like, oh my gosh, the garlic. I forgot the garlic. But quite a while and I absolutely love it. So how much garlic are you growing now? So I have two f- of my four by eight beds that I devote to the garlic. Wow. And so I have to count how many, you know, it's quite a bit. But it does last. And if you get the certain varieties, you can keep them in storage for a good amount of time. So it's not like I have to use it all up right away. When you say good amount of time, do you mean more than one year? I've never had it last that long. And again, it it depends. There's a lot of factors there, like when you harvest it, how you cure it, what variety you're using. But I can at least usually get me through the winter into spring. I harvest it in July. 
And then by, yeah, probably by that January or February, it's starting to get a little squishy. There might be some cloves in my bulbs that aren't as fresh, but you can still use it. Yeah. And do you notice a big difference between the homegrown garlic versus the store-bought garlic? I think the homegrown is just so much more fragrant. And there's just something about it being fresh. And I think, you know, a lot of the garlic we're seeing on the store shelves, like most of the food there, has just been sitting around for a while. There's also a lot of grocery store garlic that comes from China because that's a, a place where they get it cheap and it grows cheap there. And so, yeah, there's you just can't compare the freshness to something that was shipped overseas versus something you're harvesting in your backyard. Yeah, that's been in transit for a long time. We just did an episode on lettuce too. And it's like, once you realize how long lettuce is in transit to you, like, how do you not grow your own lettuce? You know, if you can, at least, you know, if you're in that part of your journey. So, okay, garlic. It's harder to grow garlic and grow bags. And I'm not in my garlic era yet. I will be soon because I'm Italian and I, we eat so much garlic. But to me, sometimes garlic selection can get a little overwhelming because there's so many different types. So can you walk us through how you select garlic to grow? I know there's a hard neck and a soft neck variety. Can you kind of walk us through that, those aspects of selecting even before we get to planting? Yes. And I think that is important. So with like potatoes, for example, you can technically take grocery store potatoes if they're organic and use those as your seed potatoes. However, I recommend that people don't do that with garlic because there is a chance that it's been sprayed with compounds to prevent it from sprouting or it can bring in diseases, or you just don't even know what variety it is. So you kind of don't know what you're dealing with, right? So I definitely would say go to a reputable seed garlic source and they're all over online. They're pretty easy to find. You just have to make sure your Territorial Seed is our sponsor. Oh, so yeah, Territorial Seed has like the widest variety of garlic, like every type of garlic you want, they've got it. Yeah. And it's really fun. I don't know why it's fun to shop for it, but it just is. So it's fun to shop for it. Make sure when you're shopping, obviously, you know, you're going to have to get it in the window because these suppliers have it right before planting and then they're not going to have it just randomly throughout the year. So it's definitely a seasonal thing to purchase. And I would say get it early. And so like most people are planting through September, October time frame. So that seed's going to be ready in late summer, you know, mid to late summer. So make sure that you are getting it early because they do sell out. There is a finite yes. amount of seed garlic. So don't wait till the last minute. You'll have a harder time. So yeah, find a good source. And then your next big choice, like you mentioned, would be soft neck or hard neck. And so it's kind of a personal preference thing. Soft neck, to me, the biggest advantage of it is that it's braidable because I love the look of a garlic braid hanging in my kitchen. And it's me too. It's not, I know it's so fun. And it's, yeah, just a little easier for storage. Most of the garlic that you're going to find at your grocery stores or your farmer's market, it's going to be probably soft neck. And if you're wondering how to tell, it's in the name, right? So soft neck is going to have above the bulb, garlic has a stalk. If you've never seen it growing, it has a stalk. Soft neck is going to be very pliable. Hard neck is like extremely rigid. And so you can't braid the hard neck. Now, beyond that, some of the differences are soft neck usually have smaller cloves. So you're going to have more cloves packed around in the bulb. Hard neck has usually, I don't know, six, eight really beautiful big cloves around the bulb. My personal preference, even though I love a garlic braid, is the hard neck because I like the bigger cloves. You know, when you're cooking, I find it really annoying to have to peel the teeny tiny baby cloves and then you have to use more. So just for ease of use as a home cook, I love the hard neck. Other benefits to hard neck would be that they send out scapes, which we can talk about that in a minute. So it's kind of like you get Mm. a little extra bang for your buck um, in the garlic culinary department. And I can't attest to this. I've never grown garlic in a Southern climate. I've only ever lived in the cooler ones. But they say that soft neck does a little bit better in the southern warmer climates than hard neck. Although I have planted both varieties here in Wyoming, and I kind of consider us to be the Arctic (laughs) of the United States. We're really cold and I've grown both successfully. So ultimately, it comes down to your preference. Do you want a braid? Do you want the bigger cloves? Do you care about the scapes? If you don't know, try both. On an episode inspired by garlic, how do we not talk about Territorial Seed Company, Plant Friends? Territorial Seed is the king or the queen of mail order, perfect garlic, ready to grow, delivered to your doorstep to give you the delicious harvests that we talk about in today's episode. And Territorial Seed Company is also a beloved partner of this podcast. 
They sponsor the show. They help us make this content to bring it to you. So they're the best. Thank you, Territorial Seed. Garlic is kind of their thing. They have like an unbelievable variety of hard neck and soft neck garlic ready to be pre-ordered by you and delivered straight to your door. In this podcast episode, we discuss the differences between hard neck and soft neck garlic in detail on this episode. So why not take the discount Territorial Seed Company offers you and pre-order one of each type of garlic, a hard neck and a soft neck garlic, and learn for yourself, empower yourself to grow and learn the similarities and the differences of the two styles of garlic. If you want to order garlic online, look no further than Territorial Seed Company. They have 40 years of expertise and undeniable passion for helping gardeners grow their own food and 100% guarantee. So there's literally no risk in trying to grow garlic for the first time with them or going back and growing garlic for your hundredth time with them, but finding new varieties that only they have to offer. It's not too early. You should pre-order your garlic now for fall shipment. The varieties sell out quickly. And you get 10% off for being a listener. So go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy to get 10% off the garlic varieties of your dreams. Shop the amazing garlic selection. Get your 10% off discount by going to territorialseed.com slash growing joy. That's territorialseed.com slash growing joy. All right, if you're growing garlic, you need garlic and you need a high quality potting mix and soil to ensure that your little garlic babies overwinter properly, plant friends. You gotta look no further than Espoma Organic, our 90-year-old family-owned and operated company that supports this podcast, and they are dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. As you plant up your garden, as you get ready to grow your garlic this fall, Make sure that you're using their potting mix or their garden soil that's suited to your gardening setup. Whether it's container gardening, raised bed gardening, or in-ground garden beds, they literally have a mix, a soil, a compost for whatever type of gardening you're doing. I love working with Espoma. They are a company run by lovely people. And to top it all off, this company has an amazing sustainability commitment, 100% solar-powered plant, zero waste manufacturing and eco-friendly packaging. To learn more about Espoma Organics indoor and outdoor products for every aspect of plant parenthood, from their potting mixes to their fertilizers, visit espoma.com to see the products and where your local Espoma dealers are. Or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of my Espoma favorites. So hard neck is hardier. It's tough. It gets through the winter better. It gives the scapes, which it's scape season right now. So scapes like ramps, I feel like people go crazy over. And then it's got bigger cloves, but you can braid the soft neck. Okay, interesting. And you said the garlic at the grocery store that we're normally buying, that's normally soft neck, you said? Yes. You know how you're going to see that more commonly because it has the little baby, little baby cloves. Flimsier top. Yeah, a little flimsier. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. So that's the soft neck versus the hard neck. And then anything within, like within hard neck or within soft neck that you should be thinking about when selecting? I don't have a favorite variety within that. There's lots of different varieties, and I can never kind of remember which one from year to year. When you go on your seed garlic website and you go shopping, you can look at the different descriptions. Some are a little purple, some have, they just have different qualities. Honestly, I've noticed that the flavor to me is pretty much the same across the board. Maybe you have a garlic connoisseur who would be like, oh my gosh, no, they're so different. But I don't think you're going to really go wrong just picking a variety that sounds appealing to you, you know, whatever the description is on the website. I feel like too, if this is your first year growing garlic, you should pick a soft neck variety and a hard neck variety and grow them for yourself and learn the differences, right? Because that's really how you can listen to a billion podcasts, but until you really do it, that's what's going to really lock it in for you. So, okay. So that's soft neck. That's hard neck. This episode is getting released in the time that people would be ordering, you know, their garlic. So if you guys want to grow garlic, you're welcome to, you know, order. We've got the coupon code from Territorial Seed, or you can go get it from whoever you want. What do we need to know in order to grow garlic? So what do we need besides the garlic cloves for growing? It's so simple. It's really just a good sunny spot in your garden. And so Mm -hmm. with me, you know, I'm planting in my raised beds all summer. And then some of those crops are going to be harvested early, like maybe the lettuce bolted or the spinach bolted. So I pull those out and I just kind of, in the back of my mind, earmark those spaces for my garlic. And so I've planted it in heavy clay soil. I've planted it in moderate, you know, just normal garden soil. I don't think you have to get super picky 
you don't want to have a ton of extra nitrogen in the soil right when you plant it because we kind of want those little babies to go dormant throughout the winter. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much. I wouldn't stress too much about the exact composition of your soil. If it's your regular garden soil, that's going to be totally fine. You could even plant it in, you know, if you don't have an official garden and you're just planting in your landscaping or your front yard or your flower beds, you could totally weave some into your other plants. And, you know, it's very much resistant to pests. A lot of pests are not going to munch on the garlic. And so I think vegetables are beautiful. I love flowers, but I think vegetables are just as pretty in landscaping and such. So you could weave those in and nobody would know the difference and it's going to give you more space. And for a lot of our landscaping, you know, the garlic above the shoot, the above ground garlic is just kind of straight up. It doesn't take up a lot of space. The bulb grows underground. So it's not like it's going to crowd out your flowers or your, you know, whatever else. It's just going to kind of grow up, stick straight. So let's talk about the life cycle of a garlic because you said it's not aligned with your tomato plants that you're planting. So can you talk about, you know, We're ordering our garlic in August, July, August. The garlic gets delivered late August. Now what? Yeah, so kind of depends on the part of the country you live in. For me and people like me who live in the north where we are waiting for those snowstorms or those really heavy frosts, September, like late September or October is your golden period to plant. You want to get it in before the ground starts to freeze Ideally, you want to get it in before the first frost, but I have totally fudged that and had a light frost and then, you know, oh my gosh, I didn't get it in in time and got it in. But you definitely have to get it in before you're super, super cold. If you're in a warmer climate in the South, October is still good, but you could wait a little bit longer. You could push it into November, December if you'd like. Honestly, like I said, I haven't grown it in the South, but I've heard garlic really does, especially the hard neck varieties that needs that colder shock of the temperatures. So if you are in a cold place like me, it's a really, really great plant because it likes the cold for that period. So yes, you're going to plant, let's say October, November, depending on where you live, then you ignore it. And I even recommend like mark the beds or make a note in your phone of where you planted it because it's so low maintenance, you will forget it exists until next spring. You'll be like, what is that thing? What are those little shoots coming up there? So it just emerges from the ground. Usually Depends on how warm I am, March, April. Usually I'll start to see little babies come through and then it grows really quickly. And then for me in my zone, I'm planning on harvesting usually in about July is when I start to pull it from the ground. So it's a long period, but it's so easy and hands off. It doesn't feel complicated at all. Okay, follow-up questions. What do you do to prep the garlic that arrives? Because you're you're breaking the garlic clove up and you're planting individual cloves, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's a great point. Um, I have heard of people not realizing that and sticking the whole bulb in the ground, which will sprout, but then you're going to be very crowded. So when you get your garlic in the mail, if you're not ready to plant it right away, because let's say you're trying to beat the rush and, and get it before it sells out, get it out of the box and just leave it in a place where it has air circulation. I've made the mistake before of forgetting about it and then it kind of starts to mildew or get a little moldy from the moisture. So get it into a place with air circulation. Just put it in your a cool, dark place until you're ready to plant. Then work your ground. I would say if you can work it up to about six inches, that's ideal just to give it plenty of space. And then yes, break your cloves up and plant one clove about six inches apart. The important part is you want the the pointy side up. So if you imagine how the cloves are going to be arranged in a bulb, right, you want to plant them in the ground just like that. But that's it. It's it's really simple. Okay, so pointy side up. And how deep are you planting the clove under the soil? So with my insane winters here, I'm shooting for at least four to six inches, six inches max, around four to six. Deep, deep down. Okay. Deep, yep. If you're a little bit warmer, you can, I've heard people recommend two inches, So you, you know, if you're not going to be getting as cold, I also like to cover mine with mulch, whether that's straw or grass clippings, just for the winter, because I like to cover all my soil with mulch as the cold months roll in. It insulates it a little bit? Insulates it and protects it from erosion and just getting kind of bleached out from all the elements. Okay. So we're planting the garlic clove, depending on where you live, two to six inches beneath. And I'm guessing you're planting deeper because the top of the soil is colder than the bottom. So you're trying to avoid that. My question, I guess, is like, how does it not just rot? Because it doesn't shoot up its stalk until after the winter. So it just sits there and it doesn't rot. 
I know. I, that's my same thought. Like every year I do it, I'm like, there's no way this is going to work. Especially when I've had my timing a little bit off where I get it in a little bit late. Because I've seen some people recommend you get it in early enough that you can water it a little bit and then it kind of goes dormant. And I have totally pushed on that recommendation so much. And it's it always comes up like really well. Like it's very rare that I have, I'll have a few missing cloves in a row that maybe uh, I have my chickens. I have to fight them in the fall. They kind of, they dig stuff up. But um, yeah, I'm shocked at how consistently it comes up. I'm like, how is this possible? It should have rotted. It should have frozen to death and rotted. It's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> right. Nature's a miracle. So, and also one other question about just logistics of planting. You know, when you break the large bulb up and the cloves, you know, when you cook, you're removing that like harder skin from the clove before you dice it up. Are you leaving the skin on as you're planting? Definitely. Yes. Leave the papery stuff on. Try to disturb it as little as possible. Okay, cool. So you're literally planting it in the fall, early fall before a frost. You're letting it get frostbite. You're letting it hibernate. In the winter, it's going to naturally wake up. The shoots are going to grow. Then it's going to start photosynthesizing and the bulb will start growing. Then what? Yeah. So there's this question. I get this question all the time. When do I harvest it? So there's a few things to look for. And again, it's going to depend on when you planted it. Like I said, when I plant in October, I can kind of bank on harvesting in July. If you plant November, December, you might be pushed out a little bit. So if you have hardneck, we mentioned scapes earlier. That's an extra bonus mm -hmm. of hardneck. And a scape is this curly little stem that comes up out of the middle of the stalk. And it's kind of pretty. And then if you leave it long enough, it develops a little uh, teardrop shape bud, a little flower on the end. So you can clip those off. And some people say, oh, you have to clip them off to make sure the bulb develops sufficiently. Most years, I don't clip them off in time and I still have great bulbs. Like I said, I'm very much like a contrarian gardener. <laughs> you're a low maintenance gardener. Yeah, you're low maintenance. Don't get fussy with me, internet. Like do not get fussy with me. <laughs> so, but yeah, you clip the scapes and you don't eat the flower part. I mean, I guess you could, but it's not as not as tasty. And then you have these little shoots and you. I like to cut mine up. You can um, saute them in butter. It's all the garlic flavor that we love, just in a different format. So saute and butter. I have a garlic scape pesto recipe on my blog that's so good. And there's all kinds of recipes online, but it's such a delicacy because they aren't something you get in stores. So literally the only way you're going to get scapes is if you get lucky enough to find them at a farmer's market or you grow them yourself. Yeah. You can pickle them too. My husband's super into pickling. Ooh, yes. Ramps are the same way. We have a friend who has like acres of ramps on her property. And so we got to go, you know, ramp harvesting, but you don't find ramps in the grocery store. You know, you just, you have to have a friend who has ramps on their property. So I've read the scapes, I guess the energy goes into the flower blooming. So if you remove it, it's like pinching your, your zinnias, you know, it, it's going to send the energy back into the bulb. And then in terms of the scape for proper harvest, if we want to enjoy that part, do you wait until the scape is curled before the bloom arrives to pinch it off? I think it depends. So I have done that because I I feel like I go out one day and there's no scapes and I go out the next day and they're huge. <laughs> like it just happens every year, right? They come up quickly. So not really that fast, but that's, you know, my perception. So I don't think if you can get the scapes when they're not giant, it's preferable because they get a little bit tougher. Okay. Which isn't a big deal if you're grinding them up for pesto or something. But if you want to eat them sauteed, you know, they get a little woodier the bigger they get. So I would say if you can get them, catch them earlier, that's best. And that way you aren't sending all that energy into the scape. You're going to preserve some of that energy for the bulb. But like I said, I have pushed the boundaries on all those recommendations and still had really beautiful bulbs and pretty large scapes. And I got away with it. So I'll let people just kind of play around with that and see what works for them. Yeah. You got to grow it to know it, right? So if you have hard neck, you're going to get those scapes. If you have soft neck, you're just going to get shoots. So if you've removed your scapes or if you're doing soft neck garlic and you're not even seeing scapes, so you don't have that almost visual trigger of, oh, the scapes are here. We're almost ready to harvest. How do I know that it's time to party? Yes, great question. So if you do have the scapes, you want to harvest them and wait about a month, roughly. If you don't have the scapes, you'll start to see the bottom two or three leaves of the plant turn yellow. And if people have ever grown potatoes, you know how you just you just see that the foliage just doesn't look as perky and you're like, OK, we're getting close. It just you can tell the foliage is starting to like peter out. Same with the garlic. So watch for that. And another option, if you're just still doubting, you can gently pull the soil back from around one of the bulbs and just check it and see what you're looking like. I would say once you're into that summer phrase, you're going to I'm going to be shocked if you don't see a pretty 
considerable sized bulb in the ground by then. And then once you determine that you're ready, I like to stop watering about a week before harvest just to give things time to dry out a little bit. I don't want the ground to be rock hard concrete because that's really hard to pull about, obviously. But I want it to start kind of drying. So we're going to have a better chance of preserving them without rotting. So you're stopping watering and then you have your harvest day where you, I'm assuming, just pull them out of the soil, right? And you've got your gorgeous bulbs. And then what? Because I've heard the word cure. You have to cure the garlic. Like you have to cure your onions. So what does that look like? It's pretty simple. The biggest thing is you want to make sure they're not going to get rained on because it kind of defeats the purpose. So with me, what I like to do is I pull the, the bulbs out. I will say if you have soil that tends to be a little more clay, be careful as you pull them because sometimes they'll pop right out and sometimes you'll break the stock off and leave the bulb in the ground. And so I usually will kind of use a shovel to loosen the soil and gently pull them out just to make sure I don't miss anything. And then I like to leave them in their bed just on top of the soil for a couple days outside just to let the sun dry them out a little bit because that moisture is the enemy of the shelf life, right? And if you're worried about rain, you can bring them into a covered area. You just want to make sure they have good airflow. And after a couple days, they're usually going to be ready to prepare for long-term storage. If it's a soft neck variety, you might you could leave them for a little bit longer until those stalks are dried out enough, but still pliable enough to braid. They're not so brittle. And if it's hard neck, I usually just leave a couple inches of the stalk and just cut it off and put it in a a container that... Once you pull them out, should the greens be like turning yellow or something? Or you're really just using time? You're not using your eyeballs, you're using time past? So you're looking for those bottom leaves to start yellowing, but you're not going to see yellowing on the whole stock when you harvest. They're still going to be green. And then they're just going to start to fade as they dry out as they cure. Okay, cool. So you're just letting them cure for like five days to a week. And then with the hard neck, you're chopping the tops off, you're leaving a couple of inches. And then the soft neck, you're braiding. Do you have any tips for braiding for us soft neck girlies? Yes. I know I have an onion braiding tutorial on my blog. I think I have a garlic one too. And there's lots of videos and stuff online. Oh, perfect. Okay. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. And it's really fun. Super easy. I think you can use a twine to kind of use as your baseline, but it's way easier than you think. Okay, great. So then what about the long-term storage? Yes. So I don't have an official root cellar. And I think most people probably don't. If you do, I'm super jealous. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So I just have a basement that is, it doesn't get below freezing by any means. And it doesn't have a lot of moisture in it like a root cellar would. But it's pretty cool and dark. And so I just put mine in a box or a basket that's going to allow for that airflow because we don't want that moisture or humidity to accumulate in a closed space because that's where we get mildewy. And I just will put it down in the dark part of my basement for the winter the fall and winter. And depending on how how well you cure it, and if you do that your first year, you'll kind of figure that out. It'll last for many months and it might sprout a little bit. I I recommend not putting it in your refrigerator because that seems to make them sprout a little bit faster, but just keep it cool, dark and dry. And you can use that all through the winter. And it's amazing how well it stores. Yeah, because once you do the curing, once you let it dry out and then you prep it, then it's just about waiting until you need it, right? So you're storing it in the cool to get the longest shelf life but you can then, once you've cured it, you can start immediately using it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you can even use it fresh. You could use it the day you harvest it, if you'd like. Before you cure it. Before you cure it. It's going to taste amazing. One of my favorite things about harvesting is just like, I get you get the oil on your hands and it smells so good. So I'm like, oh, it's like smelling mm. my hands like a weirdo the whole time I'm harvesting garlic. Because it's just the most vibrant, yeah. freshest garlic aroma you've ever experienced. But yeah, you could use it right away. The only reason we're doing that curing process is just to help it last longer. Okay. And then, you know, this sounds so easy. Are there any troubleshooting, any common issues that you see with garlic diseases or pests or anything that you should look out for in the garden to say, oh, we've got a problem here. How can we fix it? That's a good question. I actually haven't experienced a lot of issue with it. It's just been such a trooper plant. Just so easy. Yeah. I mean, that's not to say there aren't diseases. It's just I haven't experienced any in my area. And the bugs... I mean, knock on wood, I've never experienced bug issues. I think just because they don't like the taste of it, it's pretty resilient with with bugs. And so I'd say the one thing I have struggled, sometimes my irrigation gets a little heavy or I, I have my sprinklers on a little much. So I think the waterlogged soggy soil isn't great for it. And it also can create issue when you do go to, to cure it for lo- that long-term storage. It can pull that paper off. It can make the bulbs not as hardy to last in your pantry or whatever. But 
No, it's so far, I haven't had a lot of issues with diseases or pests. That's amazing. What are your favorite garlic recipes? Oh, so many. Or what are your favorite ways to use garlic, I guess? I like it in everything. I'm sure as Italian, you also, I just like, there is no recipe mm-hmm. that can not benefit without some garlic. I think one of my favorite, most pure ways to use it is just roasting it. You know, where you you snip the top off, you pour some olive oil in, put it in a little foil pack and throw it in the oven. And that's so good on bread. I have a hummus recipe where you take a whole bulb of roasted garlic and stick it in with the hummus and puree it. And I've had people go, was that a typo? And I'm like, nope, you used the whole bowl. <laughs> and that was very purposeful. Amazing. It's so good. One recipe I love is where you take a beef roast, like you're preparing it for a crock pot or, or a you know pot roast type of dish. And you cut little slits in the roast and then insert slivers of garlic in there. And so as it roasts, it cooks the garlic and the oils go into the meat. And it's that's super good too. But yeah, I mean, I put it in everything. I just can't, can't live without it. Yeah. My husband's been sick this week. And so I've been on TikTok scrolling for like natural remedies. And I've seen so many like soaking garlic honey, putting garlic honey and red onion in a jar and the properties that leach out when it all sits and and soaks together apparently is very good for colds. People keep like honey and garlic in a jar in their fridge and take like a tablespoon of it whenever they start to get sick. And yeah, I mean, I also put garlic on everything. I mean, I went through a phase where I was putting garlic in my scrambled eggs. I don't do that anymore. That was like really excessive. But yeah, having it readily available, it really does add and elevates any dish. And the idea of growing it on my own is so exciting. When I I gardened a couple of years ago with a friend who had a really epic garden and a greenhouse, and we harvested a lot of garlic and onions and just cut it like, I don't know, there was just something so special about cooking the garlic that we grew together. It just made it so much more, so much more special. Before we end, I wanted to just ask you a little bit more about your homestead for those who are interested in pursuing this lifestyle. What was the order in what you added? Garden, chickens, animals, like what was the evolution of that? I know you kind of talked about that you built it slowly and steadily, but like, what did you start with? And then what naturally came after that? Oddly enough, the first thing was a compost pile. And the reason for that was that we had no money and I had these horses with us and I didn't have a tractor to deal with the manure or get rid of the manure. And so I'm like, oh, I've got to figure out a way. There's this growing pile of horse manure in my backyard and I've got to do something with it. So we built this really humble little compost pile first. And then I was like, well, I got to do something with a compost. So I'm going to put in a garden. And then kind of, I think in that same time frame, I found some chickens on Craigslist and I impulse bought some chickens. And so, yeah, it was a stair step. And then I think the dairy goats came next. There's this gateway situation where you open your mind to the first possibility of doing something a little bit unorthodox. And then at least for me, it was just like, it all just came like a flood. Because you start to question one part of our food system or why we're doing things the way we do it. And then everything comes into question, which I think is a really positive journey. But yeah, I think a garden, any sort of garden, even if it's a balcony, even if it's houseplants, like we talked about when you were on my podcast, I think all those steps are so important and they really count. So I, I don't want anyone to ever see what I'm doing and go, oh, just because I don't have 67 acres in a greenhouse and multiple gardens that what I'm doing doesn't matter. It's not homesteading enough. Like I totally push back against that narrative because those little baby steps lead you down this path. And it's still getting you connected to the earth and connected to the soil and understanding your place in nature and understanding your place in our food system. And so those little things are really big. And like mine was just a silly little compost pile. That was my first thing that caused me to question the conventions around food and food production. And so never underestimate those baby steps. Yeah, I'm, I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, I'm in an interesting position because we're on this these five acres of land, but we're renters. So I don't want to invest in this land. It's not mine. I'm growing in grow bags. That's very limited for what I can do. And so I we also don't have compost here. But also, ironically, moving to the country, we have less access to composting at like a local farmer's market or recycling. Like it's actually much harder to compost publicly, like In the city, there was compost options everywhere. There aren't here, right? Yeah. Same with recycling. So 
we got a tabletop composter, a Lomi. I've talked about it on my podcast before. And that's been our journey because we're in nature. We're like, oh my gosh, we also have to take our garbage to the dump, right? So we want to reduce, from a selfish perspective, we want to reduce our trips to the dump because we don't have a garbage service. But it's so interesting because using this tabletop composter, which could fit in any apartment, right? It's like, I could have been doing this years ago when I was in 500 square feet in New York City. It has made me so much more acutely aware of food waste. And the food waste, because we're putting it in the compost and turning it into soil instead of putting it in the garbage. Yes, it's also reduced our trips to the dump by like 50%. That also then has made me more acutely aware of recycling and plastics. And it's not even cyclical in my garden. I'm not composting in my garden. It's this separate kind of clinical machine for me that's doing it right now because that's the option I have. But once you start, it is so true. There is a chain of reaction, whatever that's called. For me, it it really started with houseplants that then got me into nature, that got me into trees, that got me into, you know, moving out here. But it's so interesting how disconnected we are as a society to the natural way of living and how once we reconnect, it just takes off. Like once we reconnect to how we should be living and the natural like system, because even just you talking about you started with the compost, the compost led you to the garden, the garden led you to the chickens, the chickens also benefit the garden, right? Everything benefits each other. You're creating a natural ecosystem, right? Where we've just been so disconnected and we go and we get our eggs from the grocery store and we get our, we don't have to think about it that way anymore. And it's so interesting that people have to go through this in kind of intense awakening of, oh, this is like not aligned. And I need to start doing things differently, but I have to make this like epic shift. And then people think, oh, I have to go be an epic homesteader. No, like for you, it might just look like composting right now. But five years down the line, I know I'm having chickens in five years. I can't have chickens right now, but I know there's chickens in my future, you know. But it's so interesting. The more conversations I have with homesteaders like yourself, I've been very lucky to have multiple conversations this year on the podcast about homesteading and like what this kind of lifestyle looks like. and. It's so interesting, similarly to houseplants, that from the outside looking in, it feels so intimidating and so unattainable and hippie, granola, you know, whatever, whatever weird stereotypes there are for homesteading. But the more you just kind of like wiggle into it, the more sense it makes. Oh, so much. And you start to feel it in your body, too. And that's what I think. Yeah. When I first started teaching homesteading, I would fire hose people a lot because I'm like, I need them to feel all the things I'm feeling. And I've since learned, I'm like, no, if I just get them to take that first step, it does the work for me. Like their body will literally respond to what they're doing. And I don't have to do, I mean, just all I have to just get them started. I'm like, ah, I know what's going to happen next. You just make that bread. You just plant that tomato plant. I know what's going to happen. That's how I feel with houseplants. I'm like, I just need to get you to care for one houseplant successfully. If you can have one win with a houseplant, you will be put on this journey, you know, that will make you so much happier. But you, part of the journey and part of the joy that you find is actually finding it for yourself. You and I, that's not our job. Our job isn't to like force it down your throat. Our job is to set our communities, our listeners up for success so that they can go cultivate their own empowered experience. And, you know, I feel like the two of us, we've talked about this offline, but I feel like we're such a a power couple of podcasts for people because it's like, especially with city people, you know, I will help people get that first house plant, you know, that first basil garden, that first, these first, 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 and then you can help them take the next steps. It's like at my point, five years in, I'm your student now where I'm like, okay, how do I keep this going? But it took me five years to get here, you know? So it's very interesting. It's And it's such an honor to be part of people's journeys because I do feel like this is like the most it's just such a gift to be experiencing these joys that I think you and I have both talked about on our shows that once again, from the outside in look completely crazy. But when you're on the inside, you're like, oh yeah, plants are the answer. (laughs) It is the answer. I know. And that's what, so it's, sometimes it's hard when people are, you know, get the question, what do you do? And I'm like, you know, it's like, how do I, how do I describe? I teach old fashioned skills, which sounds like so meh, like, oh, I teach people how to make bread or I teach people how to can. And I'm like, no, I don't know how to encapsulate because both you and I, it looks like we're just teaching 
from someone on the outside, it looks like we're just teaching practical like how to's, right? How to do house plants, how to set them up in your window. And then I'm teaching how to keep chickens and how to make sourdough bread. But you and I both know, as we've talked about, like there's that deeper level that I, that I, which is why I love talking to you so much because we've tapped into that. And I think bringing that to the world is the biggest gift. Like I love the tutorials, but I'm like getting people to understand that deeper connection is really what our culture needs right now. So yeah. It's the result. Yeah. And how lucky are we to both be doing this with our podcast? So I love Jill's podcast. You've got to visit Jill's blog. It's epic. And it is, it is totally aspirational. She's showing us what you can do, but also you, that you don't have to do it all. Everybody can just go plant some garlic and plant your garlic and then, you know, remove that, that trip to the grocery store for yourself. That could be it, right? Or a little pot on, of basil on your windowsill. But where can everyone go find you, listen to your show, follow your blog, follow you on Instagram, tell us all the things. Yes. So the original blog with, I mean, there's hundreds of blog posts over there. All the tutorials and stuff is theprairiehomestead.com. And then the podcast is Old Fashioned On Purpose. On social media, I'm I'm on a lot of platforms, but I'm most active on Instagram. That's kind of my favorite place to hang out. So my handle there is jill.winger. And I do have a book coming out this year in September. So if you are interested in this idea of that old fashioned life and kind of what, you know, Marina, I've been talking about in terms of yeah, it's practical skills, but the deeper piece behind that and how to bring that into your life, even if you're not going to move to Wyoming and get a milk cow, which most people are not. The book is called Old Fashioned on Purpose, and it kind of explores a lot of those ideas. Yes. And this episode's coming out in August. So pre-order, pre-order the book, guys. Yes, pre-order, please. Pre-orders are like a big thing for publishing. Now that I know that, every time I have an author on, I'm like, pre-order her book and review it on Goodreads when you get it. <laughs> we have a bunch of bonuses just for pre-order folks like a bunch of there's sourdough guides and home dairy stuff and recipes and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, you can get all the goodies. Speaking of bonuses, when you join your email list, I joined your email list last month, you give access to a whole freaking library of stuff. I've never seen that for just giving you my email address. The benefit of being online for so long, I've created a lot of things. And so I get to give away a lot of fun stuff because I have a lot in my my archives. So sometimes my business coaches are like, Jill, you can't give all that away. I'm like, but I want to. I like to over deliver. So yeah, it's fun to, to share. So we'll make sure all those links are in the show notes. Jill, this was so fun. And I hope this is the first of many guest spots that you come back on the show in the future to teach us more homesteading things. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jill. Man, me and Jill really hit it off. Uh, She is so cool. And she's kind of like who I want to be when I grow up. (laughs) She's amazing. I can't stop thinking about chickens and I can't stop thinking about having a homestead. Billy and I talk about it often. I'm so inspired to grow garlic. I also love if you like this episode, if you're curious, in I think 2021, I did a two-part series with Plant Lady Bree about garden pests. And garlic is an amazing way to deter like groundhogs and, you know, moles and voles from your plants because they don't like the scent. So garlic is multifaceted, valuable in so many different ways. Make sure that if you're ordering garlic, try Territorial Seed Company. You know, they sponsor this show. They support this show. They help me bring these episodes to you. So if you want to try garlic, if you're feeling inspired after this episode, definitely check them out. Get 10% off of whatever you order. They have a 100% guarantee. And um, you can go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy to get your order in. I know I'm going to put my order in. And also just a growing joy thought, you know, I love the concept of this garlic overwintering and that concept of planting a seed and having to wait a really long time and trusting that the bulb is growing and multiplying and having to wait until the spring to see what comes. I think that's a beautiful metaphor for life. And so I'm excited to try planting garlic and waiting for that fateful moment in the spring where those green stems stick out of the soil and remind me that stuff is always planted and growing within you, whether you can see it or not. And with that thought, my sweet plant friends, until next time, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast. So I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. 
If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to up-level your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.